Freddy the Pig to and again. Chapter 10. Now as they went along, the weather got warmer and warmer, so they got up very early in the morning and did most of their traveling while it was still cool. About eleven o'clock they would stop under the shade of a big tree by the roadside and lie about in the grass and talk until late in the afternoon, and then they would go on for a while until they found a good camping place where they came to a river or a pond. They would all go in swimming. It was the pleasantest life they can imagine. One day, about noon, they were all sitting in the shade beside the road at the top of a steep hill. On the other side of the road was a house, but nobody was in sight but a little girl who was wheeling her dolls up and down in a doll baby carriage. Most of the animals were asleep because Jinx the cat had been talking and nobody paid any attention when he talked. That didn't make any difference to Jinx, though. He went right on telling how smart he was and bragging about what he could do. That was the worst about Jinx. He always talked about himself. If the animals talked about automobiles, he would say how much he knew about them and how well he could run one. And if they said, let's go in swimming, he told what a fine swimmer he was, and although they all knew he hated the water and couldn't swim two strokes. Today, he was talking about bicycles. "'Tisn't anything to ride a bicycle,' he said. "'I've ridden them all kinds, bicycles and tricycles.' "'Oh, you're a wonder,' said Freddy crossly. And all the other animals who were awake said, "'Oh, please, keep still, Jinx.' Alice and Emma, the two white ducks, didn't say anything, however, because they were always very polite and were afraid of hurting Jinx's feelings. They were almost too polite, if such a thing is possible. But they were just as tired of hearing Jinx talk as the others were. So Alice said, Come on, Emma, let's go play with that little girl. And they got up and ruffled out their feathers and waddled sedately across the road and up the path to the house. The little girl was delighted to have someone to play with, and she put the ducks in the carriage, and with the two dolls, and pretended that they were the neighbor's children, and that she had to look after them while their mother was out shopping. And she pretended that they might catch cold, and wrapped them up in little blankets, and Alice and Emma were so polite that they let her do it, although it was so hot, and that nearly made them boil. Then the little girl said, Are you comfortable, darlings? And Emma said, Quack, quack. Oh, said the little girl, she can say mama. And Emma had to keep on quacking for quite a long time, while the little girl hopped up and down and clapped her hands. By and by, the little girl got tired of this and said she would take them for a ride. So she wheeled them down the path and into the road. Then she saw a bright blue butterfly and ran across the field after it, leaving the doll's baby carriage standing in the road at the top of the hill, near where the animals were resting. Jinx was still talking about bicycles. I can ride backwards and with both paws on the handlebars and I can ride up and down stairs. Oh, stop talking such foolishness, said Henrietta. You couldn't ride a bicycle. Your legs aren't long enough to reach the pedals. They wouldn't have to be, said Jinx. I could do all that going downhill. Just start at the top and wheeze down you go at 60 miles an hour and... Oh, stop talking, exclaimed Henrietta. I never heard such an animal. Brag, brag, brag. That's all there is to you. You wouldn't dare ride down that hill in the doll carriage there. Ho, oh, said Jinx. That's nothing. That's so easy it isn't worth bothering about. All right, said Henrietta. Let's see you do it then. I suppose you think I can't, said Jinx. I think you won't, said Henrietta bluntly. Jinx got up and walked over to the doll carriage and climbed into it beside Alice and Emma and two dolls. Why, it isn't anything, he said. It isn't anything at all. Just slide down that hill. Whew! 
but he didn't seem very anxious to start. Please get out of the carriage, Jinx, said Emma. There isn't room for all of us in here. Are you really going to slide down the hill? asked Alice. Because if you are, I'm going to get out. Slide down the hill, said Jinx, and climb all the way back again in the hot sun just to prove I can do it. Ha! I should say not. If they don't believe me, well, they needn't, that's all. All the animals had waked up by now and had come out onto the road. You don't dare slide down the hill, they shouted. Brady Cat, coward, said Freddy, and he made up a song as he danced round the carriage on his hind legs. Frayed Cat Jinx, his tail's full of kinks. He doesn't dare slide down the hill. See how he shrinks. Now Jinx had no intention of sliding down the hill, which was a good mile long with a curve at the bottom, and he was thinking hard of some good excuse. But while he was hesitating, Freddy bumped against the wheel of the carriage and gave it just enough of a push to start it slowly down the hill. Hey, what are you doing? yelled Jinx, too frightened to jump. The animals stopped shouting and stood with their mouths open as the doll carriage gathered speed and shot away from them down the steep hill. They heard the scared quacking of Alice and Emma and saw their little white heads peering fearfully out. They saw Jinx holding on for dear life with all his twenty claws as the carriage jumped and bounded from side to side of the road, and then it grew smaller and smaller and disappeared round the curve. The animals were very much frightened, and they started down the hill as fast as they could go. Halfway down, they heard a great noise behind them, and it was the little girl who was coming after them, crying and sobbing at the loss of her dolls. "'That bad cat!' she wailed. "'That bad, wicked cat! He stole my doll carriage and ran off with my dollies!' The animals waited until she caught up and Hank knelt down and let her climb up on his back. Pretty soon they got to the curve at the foot of the hill. They went round it, and there was a bridge crossing a stream. And halfway across the bridge lay the doll carriage, upside down, and a very wet jinx with a bruise over one eye was crawling up on the bank out of the water. And out in the middle of the stream, Alice and Emma were swimming about and quacking as if nothing had happened. When the carriage had turned over, it had been going so fast that the ducks and the dolls and the cat had been thrown way up over the top of the bridge into the water. The dolls had sunk and the cat had sunk too for a few minutes and had had a hard time getting ashore, for he wasn't much of a swimmer in spite of his bragging, but Alice and Emma hadn't minded a bit. As soon as Jinx saw his friends, he tried to look as if he had done it on purpose. There, he said. I guess you won't dare me to do anything again. I guess I did it, didn't I? I guess you haven't got much to say. But the little girl jumped down from Hank's back and went over to him and began slapping him good and hard. You bad cat, she cried. You bad, bad cat. Where are my dollies? Jinx made himself as small as possible and put his head down between his paws and let her spank him. It didn't hurt as much as she thought it did, and as he said afterwards to Freddy, it knocked all the water out of my fur. But Alice and Emma dived for the dolls and brought them up and laid them on the bank to dry, and after a while, when the little girl had was tired of spanking Jinx, she put them into the carriage again, and Mrs. Wiggins pushed it back up the hill for her. But the little girl rode up on Hank's back. After that, Jinx didn't talk so much, and if he did begin to boast all the animals had to do was to say, Kidnapper, doll stealer, who got spanked by a girl, and he would curl up and pretend to go to sleep. Chapter 11 
And now, at last, one day, when the animals had been walking all morning through wild and swampy woods, they came out at the top of a long slope that went down to a wide valley in which were many green trees and comfortable-looking white house. A soft wind blew over the valley and puffed into their faces a sweet, delicious perfume that none of them had ever smelled before. They sniffed the air delightedly. Mmm, said Mrs. Wiggins. Isn't that good? It's better than clover. I wonder what it is. I know, said Jack. I've smelt it at weddings. See all those little green trees down there? They're orange trees, and that smell is orange blossoms. Look, look, said Freddy. There's a palm tree. It's Florida, shouted Jinx. And all the animals shouted together, Florida, so they could be heard for miles. And Alice and Emma hopped about and quacked and flapped their wings. And Charles crowed, the dogs barked, and Mrs. Wiggins mooed. And Hank, the old white horse, danced around like a young colt until his legs got all tangled up and he fell down and everybody laughed. Even the spiders raced round and round the web they had spun between Mrs. Wiggins' horns and the mice capered and pranced. So this is Florida, said Mrs. Wiggins. Well, well. Then they started down the slope into Florida, and as they went, Freddy made up a song. The weather grew torrider, torrider, and the orange blossoms smelt horrider and horrider. And as we marched down into Florida, but the orange blossoms don't smell horrid, said Robert. I know it, said Freddy, but there isn't any word that rhymes. Well, make up another song then, said Robert. So Freddy sang. Oh, the winding road to Florida is a dusty road and long, but we animals happy have cheered the way with many a merry song. Our hearts were bold, but our homes were cold, and that is why we've come to Florida, to Florida, from our far-off northern home. In Florida, in Florida, where the orange blossoms blow, where the alligators sing so sweet, and the sweet potatoes grow, Oh, that is the place where I would be, and that is where I am, in Florida, in Florida, as happy as a clam. They all liked this song much better, and they all went along and sang it happily. They were so glad to have reached Florida at last that they forgot all about shopping, stopping to rest at noon, and they marched on until nearly three o'clock. Then Mrs. Wiggins sank down under a tree beside the road. I can't go another step, she said. I'm in the dripping perspirations now. Charles, I'd take it kindly if you'd fan me with your wing for a few minutes. So they all sat down, and Charles very kindly fanned Mrs. Wiggins until she was cooled off. And as they were all pretty tired and hot, they decided to camp there that night and think about what they were going to do in Florida. And then in the morning, they could go and begin doing it. So they camped under the orange blossom tree and discussed all the things they would do. And at last they decided to go to the seashore, as Freddy said he understood the sea bathing was very fine there. But how can we find the seashore? asked Robert. You ought to have had the robin draw it on the map. Freddy said it would be easy to find because Florida was a peninsula. What's a peninsula? asked Jack, and Henrietta said, Oh, don't ask him. He's just trying to show off. But Freddy said, A peninsula is a piece of land that is almost surrounded by water. That means that if you walk far enough in any direction but one, you will come to the ocean. Yes, said Robert, but how do you know which direction is the one we ought not to walk in? Why, the direction we came from, stupid, said Freddy. And he drew a little map on the ground and showed the animals what he meant. So the next morning they started out to find the ocean. They traveled for four days before they saw it. 
away off in the distance, glittering and sparkling in the sunlight. It was still another day before they came down to a broad beach of yellow sand and saw the great sheet of water stretching away before them for miles and miles. They just stood and looked at it for a long time, for none of them had ever seen anything like it before. And they rushed down the beach and swam out into the water. So for a month they lived by the side of the sea and rested for their long journey. They found an old barn not very far from the shore, and they cleaned it up and all lived there together. Every day at four o'clock they went in for a dip and, and to surf, and then they would lie down on the sand and talk until supper time. It was a very lazy and pleasant time that they lived in Florida. But after a while, they got tired of doing nothing, began to long for new adventures. Besides, we ought to travel round and see the country, said Charles. When we go home and everybody asks us what Florida is like, we want to be able to tell them. So they said goodbye to the seashore and to the horseshoe crabs and the jellyfish who had made them who had made things so pleasant for them during their stay and set out for a tour of the states. Chapter 12 During the next two months they visited all the principal points of interest in Florida and saw all there was to see. They visited Palm Beach and the Everglades and Miami and the Big Cypress Swamp and it was on the way across a corner of the swamp that they had a very exciting adventure. It happened this way. When they first came to the swamp, most of the animals were afraid and did not want to go into it at all, for it stretched for miles and miles, and there were no roads or paths, and there was no firm ground to walk on, only water and mud and the great twisted gnarly cypress roots. It was dark, too, because the trees grew so thick. But Jink said, Oh, come on, let's see what it's like. We don't have to go very far in. What are you afraid of? And so they started in. At first it wasn't very hard walking, but soon the mud in the water got deeper and the trees thicker again. And after a while longer there wasn't anything to walk on at all, only water and trees. I'm going back, said Mrs. Wiggins, and the other animals said they were too. Even Jinx agreed they couldn't go any farther. But when they started to go back, they found that they hadn't the slightest idea which way to go. They had turned and twisted in and out among the trees so many times that they didn't know from which direction they had come. The water covered their footprints so they couldn't follow them, and over their heads the branches were so thick that they couldn't see the sun. Now we are in a mess, said Henrietta, who had been riding on Hank's back. I hope you're satisfied, Jinx. It won't help any to call names, said Mrs. Wiggins. Come along, let's try this direction. One way is as good as another, and this looks as if it might be right. And so they went on, with Mrs. Wiggins in lead, it was very dark and dismal, the water was black, and the long beards of gray moss hung down from the branches of the trees. Again and again they had to swim, and the animals who could not swim climbed on the larger animals' back. At last it did seem as if they were coming out on dry land, and ahead of them they could see sunlight through the tree trunks, and they floundered and stumbled onward as fast as they could go. In a few minutes they came out on the bank of what seemed to be a small channel, and beyond the channel was a grassy meadow, green and pleasant in the bright sun. Well, this certainly isn't the way we came, said Mrs. Wiggins, but my word, that grass looks good. I guess we could get away with a few mouthfuls. Huh, Hank? Come along, all the animals, let's swim over. It's something to stand on at any rate. Look out, don't bump your noses on those logs, said Jinx, pointing with one claw to what looked like a tree trunk, laying halfway in the water in the middle of the channel. So they all swam over, but as they were climbing out on the farther bank, Henrietta began to cackle excitedly. Look, look, the logs are all coming to life. 
and sure enough, what they had thought were logs had suddenly started swimming after them. They were alligators. I certainly do not like this place, said Mrs. Wiggins, but like most cows, she had a stout heart, and she turned round and lowered her horns and shook them threateningly at the alligators. Keep away now, she said. We won't stand any nonsense. But the alligators only laughed, and one of them said, Ho, ho, you won't, eh? Well, what do you come into our country for, then? We're peaceable animals, said Mrs. Wiggins, and all we ask is to be shown the shortest way out of your country. We are lost, and we shall be very much obliged if you would help us to find ourselves again. But if you won't help us, we shall have to go on and find our way ourselves. Then all the alligators laughed so hard the two of them choked, and their friends had to whack them on the back with their tails, and they said, Do you know where you are? You are on an island in the middle of alligator country. You can't get away, and tonight we alligators are going to have you for supper. The animals saw now that they were indeed in a bad fix. This is even worse than being fricasseed, said Charles. But Freddy, the clever pig, had an idea, and although he was very much scared, he said to the alligator, Gentlemen, you will make a very great mistake if you eat us. We are not ordinary animals. We are the first animals in the world who have ever migrated. We have come from far in the north, thousands of miles we have traveled, to visit your beautiful country and to take back words of its loveliness to our people. Surely you would not be so inhospitable as to eat us for supper. He speaks very nicely, said one of the alligators, but I'm sure he would taste even better. He's so round and plump. But another one said, There may be something in what you say, pig. We will take you to the grandfather of all the alligators, that you may tell him what you have told us, and perhaps he will let you go, and perhaps he will eat you for supper just the same. But that is for him to decide. And so he led them across the island to where the water and the swamp began to again on the other side, and he stood on the bank and called, O oh, grandfather of all alligators, there is a stranger here who would speak with you. Nothing happened for some time, and then there was bubbling and boiling of water, and a huge head, as big as a barrel, appeared, and after the head, a body as long as Mrs. Wiggins and Hank and Jack and Robert and Freddy together, and it was the grandfather of all alligators, and he was so old that there was green moss growing all over him. And he opened one wise old eye and his deep grumbling voice and said sleepily, "'What do you want?' "'They don't want to be eaten for supper,' said the other alligator. "'Eat them for lunch, then,' said the grandfather of all alligators, and began to sink out of sight again. But Freddy rushed down to the edge of the water and shouted, "'Oh, grandfather of all alligators, we are strangers in your beautiful country, and we have come thousands of miles to visit and tell you of our own land, of which you have never heard.' The grandfather of all alligators opened both eyes and stopped sinking. Why didn't you say so in the first place? he asked. That alters the case entirely. I hear very little news of the great world in this quiet spot. By all means, tell me of your home. Oh, grandfather, of all the freddy began but the grandfather of all the alligators stopped him it will be better he said if you call me simply grandfather and he closed his eyes and sank till everything but his ears was under the water and prepared to listen then freddy told of the life they had lived on the north and of mr bean's farm and of how cold it was in the winter and of their trip to the south 
Every time he stopped for breath, the alligators, who were sitting round him in the circle, would say, Yes, yes, go on. And Freddy went on until he was tired, and then Jinx took up the story until he was tired, and then Charles went on with it. And by the time Charles had finished, they had told everything they could think of. It was almost sunset, and the grandfather of all alligators came up to the top of the water again and opened his eyes and said, I thank you for telling us of your wonderful country. It has been very interesting. And now, as it is almost supper time, we will go on with the feast. I am sure you will taste all the better for the entertainment you have given us. At this, the animals were very much alarmed. You don't mean to say you meant to eat us all along, they cried. Why, of course, said the grandfather of all alligators. Nothing was ever said about us not eating you, was there? This made the animals very angry, and Jinx was so mad that he almost had a fit. You mean to say, he screamed, that you've gone and let us talk ourselves hoarse for nothing? You great big muddy long-nosed leather-skinned hippopotamus, you! You ought to be ashamed of yourself! What do you suppose all the animals up north are going to think when you have eaten us, eating up visitors who come to make you a friendly call, a nice opinion they'll get of Florida? My goodness, I should say so, exclaimed Mrs. Wiggins, and the President of the United States, too. He shook hands with us and wished us a pleasant journey. What'll he say? He'll send his army down here and drive all of you alligators into the ocean. That's what he'll do, said Jinx. The alligator of all alligators smiled, and his smile was eight feet wide. What you say may be so, he remarked, but who's going to tell him? Answer me that. Who's going to tell him? You, madame? He asked Mrs. Wiggins. No, I think not. You'll be eaten up horns, hooves, and tail, and so... But Henrietta interrupted. We're going to tell him, she said. My husband and I, you may eat the animals, but you can't eat us because you can't catch us. We can fly. My dear, said the grandfather of all alligators, I am more than 800 years old. I was centuries old when Ponce de Leon came to Florida to look for the Fountain of Youth. I remember Baboa well, a tall man with black beard and shiny steel boots. He made the same mistake you did, my friends. He mistook me for a log. But he was more fortunate than you. He got away with merely the loss of one of his boots. The grandfather of all alligators smiled at the memory. Ah, a delicious boot that was, too, old Spanish leather. I chewed on it for half a day. Yes, as I was saying, I am very old. Yet in all my eight hundred years, I have never seen or heard of a hen or rooster who could fly like a bird. Now, it is true that hens and roosters can't fly as well as most birds, but they don't like to be reminded of it. Henrietta became very angry. Is that so? she exclaimed. Well, if you've kept your eyes shut for 800 years, it's no wonder you don't know anything. Never saw a rooster who could fly, eh? Well, you're going to see one now, Charles, she said to her husband. Fly up to those trees on the other side of the water. Now the trees were quite a long way off, and Charles had never in his life flown farther than from the ground to the top of a fence. Good gracious, Henrietta, he whispered, I can't fly up there. I won't be able to go half that distance, and I'll drop into the water and the alligators will eat me. They'll certainly eat you if you don't fly up there, she whispered back. You've got to do it. It's our only chance of escaping. If they think... You will go back and tell the president. They will let us go. Well, I'll try it, said Charles, and he kissed Henrietta goodbye 
and squared his shoulders and flapped his wings and started while all the animals cheered and the alligators giggled and poked each other in the ribs with their elbows. Charles flew up into the air, up, up higher than he had ever before, as high as the tops of the trees, and then he started across the water. Down below, the animals held their breaths as they watched him. They saw him flapping his wings so hard that feathers flew out of them and floated downward, but he could not get any higher. He was coming slowly down towards the water, and two of the alligators plunged in and swam out to be under him when he came down. "'He'll never make it,' said Mrs. Wiggins sadly. "'Never in the world!' But suddenly they saw him stop moving his wings. He spread out and held them motionless, and then, to the amazement of all the onlookers, he went straight across the water faster, faster, and landed with a flutter in the trees. What had happened was this. There was a strong wind blowing across the swamp, but the island, shut in by walls of high trees, was like a room, and the wind did not come down there at all. It was this wind that had caught Charles and blown him safely across, but of course none of the onlookers knew this, and they thought that he had done it himself. Then all the animals set up a great cheer, and the alligators had nothing to say at all, and the grandfather of all alligators opened his eyes wider than he had opened them in six hundred years and exclaimed, Well, upon my word, I never should have believed it, never. But Henrietta said, Now, what are you going to do about eating us? Why, that was all a joke, my dear, said the grandfather of all alligators. We alligators will have our little jokes, you know. Do tell your accomplished husband to come back so that we can thank him for this fine exhibition, and then he will show you the way out of the swamp and put in the peace and goodwill. Oh, you and you old fraud, said Henrietta, ask him to come back as you can eat him. No, Charles, he will stay right there. He is in the top of the trees. Your suspicions are most unjust, said the grandfather of all alligators with a sigh. We wouldn't harm him for the world. We respect and admire him greatly. However, I see you are anxious to be gone, and it is indeed getting late. My children, he said to the other alligators, show these animals safely to the edge of the swamp and see that no harm comes to them. Goodbye, my friends. I thank you, one and all, for your entertainment. I am sorry that you took our little joke in earnest. However, that is past now. No hard feelings, I trust. Oh, none at all, said Henrietta sarcastically, and the grandfather of all alligators sank slowly out of sight. The alligators showed the animals a dry and easy path to the edge of the swamp, and they were very happy when they were on dry land once more. Charles had not come down within reach of the alligators, but had fluttered along in the treetops. Then the alligators said goodbye and wished them a pleasant journey. When the animals had gone on a little way, they looked back and saw the alligators sitting in a row and looking after them, and great tears were rolling from their eyes and dropping to the ground and the sound of their sobbing could be heard for miles. "'Why, I believe they really are sorry to have us going,' said Alice the Duck. "'I suppose it is lonesome in the dreary swamp.' "'Huh!' said Henrietta. "'Of course they're sorry, but they're not crying because they like us. "'They're crying because they'll have to go to bed without supper tonight.'